In the days following the Detroit Grand Prix, the attempted assassination of the Israeli ambassador in London had its desired effect, as Israeli forces invaded the south of Lebanon in Operation Peace for Galilee, an act condemned by the UN Security Council. Down in the South Atlantic, British forces landed more ground troops at Bluff Cove, close to the Falklands capital of Port Stanley, and managed to scrape up enough helicopters to ferry some of the paratroopers and commandos over from Goose Green. During the landings, air attacks sank another British ship, the fleet auxiliary Sir Galahad, manned by a civilian crew mostly from Hong Kong. Set on fire, the evacuation by a combination of Navy helicopters, onboard soldiers and engineers, and other soldiers from the Bluff Cove landings became headline news back home. One of the soldiers on board the ship, Simon Weston of the Welsh Guards, suffered 46% burns and would go on to become well known in the UK for his charity work. On the same day as all this was going on, Ronald Reagan became the first ever president to address a joint session of the British Parliament as part of a visit to Europe in which he hoped to begin negotiations for a reduction in nuclear missiles. On the 11th, E.T. the Extraterrestrial was released at US cinemas. The film, based on Steven Spielberg's own memories of having an imaginary friend, was an instant hit, surpassing Star Wars to become the highest-grossing film of all time at that date, and critically acclaimed, too. On the same day, Grease 2 also hit cinemas, giving Michelle Pfeiffer her first leading role, but never being as successful as the original. Other movies released that summer include Clint Eastwood's Cold War thriller Firefox, Ridley Scott's classic Blade Runner, John Carpenter's horror flick The Thing, groundbreaking CGI film Tron, seminal coming-of-age film Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Friday the 13th Part 3, released as part of the ongoing brief revival of 3D movies, Toe Hooper's Poltergeist, and fan favourite Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. And finally, on the day of the Canadian Grand Prix, the 1982 World Cup kicked off in Spain, with a surprise defeat for defending champions Argentina at the hands of Belgium. The game was played at the Camp Nou Stadium in Barcelona, where the local fans were eager to see their new signing, Diego Maradona, make his World Cup debut. Three of the British nations had qualified with Scotland, grouped with Brazil, New Zealand and the USSR, England with France, Czechoslovakia and Kuwait, and Northern Ireland, making their first appearance since 1958, facing hosts Spain, Yugoslavia and Honduras. The Formula One teams packed up and moved on to Montreal, and the newly renamed Circuit Gilles Villeneuve. Canada, and Quebec particularly, were still in mourning for their hometown hero, and Gilles' father would be in attendance to present the winner's trophy at the end of the race. The Tolman team were still absent, declining to spend the air freight costs for just one race, and there was one new face in the paddock. With Jan Lammers still out with his broken thumb, Jeff Lees would drive the Theodore. Jeff Lees had been brought up near the Mallory Park circuit in the Midlands and was bitten by the racing bug at an early age, working in a garage to save money for his first car and being able to exchange a few words with Graham Hill at Mallory Park one year. He moved into Formula Ford and after stunningly successful 1975, 32 wins out of 40 races, in 1978 he moved into Formula One with the unofficial Aurora series and in 1979 he made his full F1 debut with a one-off Tyrrell drive as a last-minute substitute for Jean-Pierre Jarier. In 1980 he tried again with Shadow, but the car was dreadful and so was the ensign who drove after Shadow were wound up. Later that same season he even had a go with a customer Williams FW07, but was suffering from the flu and didn't do well. Nonetheless, he continued to do well in Formula 2 and won the European F2 title in 1981 in a works route, beating several other drivers on the current F1 grid, including Guerrero, Alboreto, Winkelhock and Paletti. Elsewhere, there was news on the Ferrari front, with Patrick Tombe announced as Didier Pironi's new teammate. He would debut at the next race in the Netherlands. With no trip home between races, several teams were working round the clock to repair cars damaged in Detroit. ATS were down to two cars with no spare, while Azella, who had denied poor Riccardo Paletti his second F1 start when they bounced him out of his car to give it to the team leader Jarier, who'd broken both his own and the spare, had managed to repair both and were back up to three cars. Paletti would be hoping for better luck this weekend as it was the week of his 24th birthday and his mother had flown out from Italy to watch the race. Having had a heat wave all week, it drizzled through most of the first qualifying session on Friday, so it was all down to Saturday's sunny session to determine the grid. With the circuit favouring power, it was no surprise that the top four grid slots all went to turbo runners, Didier Peroni taking the top spot, dedicating the pole to Villeneuve. 
Behind him were the two Renaults of Arnoux and Prost, then Piquet, who had a much better time with his BMW engine on song for a change. Giacomelli was fifth, then Watson and Rosberg, with Patrese still in the older Ford-powered Brabham eighth. De Cesaris and De Angelis made up the top ten, while at the back Paletti made it onto the grid in 23rd, ahead of Salazar, Jeff Lees and Brian Henton, with Winkelhock and Serra joining the usual suspect De Viotta in failing to qualify. Sunday dawned grey and cold, and just to top the misery for spectators, there was a strike on Montreal's metro system, so the circuit organisers had to scrape together a hundred buses to ferry people to the track, and the crowd was lower than in previous years, perhaps feeling the absence of Gilles Villeneuve too. In order to hit the best broadcast slot for Europe, the race wouldn't start until 4.15pm, and by the time of the pre-race warm-up at 1.15, everyone in the paddock had been up since dawn and was thoroughly cold and miserable and the cars didn't seem up for it either, with a series of gremlins affecting many of them. Finally though, everyone was ready to go and the parade lap was run. Some of the cars at the back took a while getting into place and the grid was held on the red for an abnormally long time. Just as the lights went green, Peroni's engine stalled. The cars at the front got round OK, with Arnoux going into the lead, but further back, the cars were going faster. Bozell clipped the back of the Ferrari, spinning into Mass and Salazar, but then Riccardo Paletti arrived unsighted at over 100 miles an hour and ploughed square on into the back of Peroni's car. Peroni was the first to Paletti's car, swiftly followed by Professor Sid Watkins and track Dr Jacques Bouchard. The medics just had time to conclude that Paletti was unconscious when the leaking petrol tank, 45 gallons full, caught fire. Even once the fire was out, it took the rescue teams 25 minutes to cut Ricardo from the car, because every time they got the cutting tools running, the sparks threatened to reignite the spilled petrol. Eventually, Paletti was helicoptered to hospital, but to no avail. In all likelihood, he'd died in the initial impact, and Watkins would later conclude that the long delay in extinguishing the fire and removing Paletti from the car had had no impact on his chances of survival. His mother had watched the whole thing from the grandstand. As in Belgium, the race would continue, though without any real enthusiasm. The Azella team, shattered, withdrew Jarier's entry and left, and two hours later, at 6.15 in the evening, the grid reformed, minus Jeff Lees's Theodore, which had been too badly bent in the incident, and had no spare car available. The second start was mercifully incident-free, with Peroni keeping his lead ahead of Arnoux and Prost, who had PK tucked right up behind him. However, Peroni was in the spare Ferrari, an older model, and the engine had been playing up during the second warm-up. Arnoux was soon passed and into the lead, while Piquet made short work of Prost. As Piquet looked for a way past Peroni, Mansell and Giacomelli tangled and were both out, with the Alpha stopped on the racing line. Bruno gave his car a good kicking as he got out. The marshals had to wait until the still-running cars had passed before they could shift the stricken car, but thankfully without incident. Mansell, however, was taken to hospital with what turned out to be a broken arm. Meanwhile, Peroni was dropping back further, with Piquet and Prost both finding their way past during lap two. Meanwhile, the defending champion was on a flyer, closing up on Arnoux. Watson and Cheva, the top two in Detroit, were next up behind the Ferrari, and also having their own scrap over fifth place. Cheva caught Watson napping, and the Ulsterman then also lost six to De Cesaris. Roberto Guerrero came in for a third time in as many laps to finally give up and retire, while Watson now had Patrese nipping at his heels. At the start of lap 9, Piquet got past Arnoux into the first S-band. So it was Piquet, Arnoux, Prost, Chiva, De Cesaris and Patrese in the top 6 at the end of lap 10, with a huge gap between turbocharged Prost and non-turbocharged Chiva. Patrese was on a flyer though, and soon made his way up ahead of De Cesaris and Chiva to 4th. Things stayed more or less like that for another 10 laps or so, until yet another double setback befell Renault. First, on lap 28, Arnoux spun and stalled. Then two laps later, Prost's engine, which had been troublesome all race, finally called it quits. So with just over half distance to go, Piquet now led Patrese by a country mile, with De Cesaris now third, then Cheever, Watson and Daly. Piquet had the BMW people worried briefly when his engine emitted a puff of black smoke, but it seemed to sort itself out and he kept running smoothly enough in the lead, clocking away the laps a steady 20 seconds or so ahead of Patrese. As the race ended its last 20 laps, Patrese started to gain on Piquet as the Brazilian eased off to conserve his engine, but from too far back to make much difference. The top six had remained the same for about half the race and nothing changed much before the end. Piquet had a bit of a moment bouncing over the kerbs just in case he was falling asleep. Four laps from the end, 
Eddie Cheever rolled to a stop out of fuel, promoting Watson and Daly, but then on the last lap both Cesaris and Daly also sputtered to a halt in the same spot. Nothing was going to stop PK though, as he cruised to his first win of the year and BMW's first win in Formula 1. Patrese followed him home for a Brabham 1-2 that had seemed like a very long time in coming indeed. John Watson inherited third to stay top of the driver's table, with DeAngelis and Sierra likewise finding themselves fourth and fifth. De Cesaris had done enough to be classified sixth and earned a consolation point for his trouble, while Derek Daly found himself just out of the points in seventh. Seville Villeneuve was there to present the trophy, reminding everyone of the sport's previous tragedy just months before, and there wasn't much celebration going on on the podium. Everyone seemed just glad to end the whole miserable weekend and head home. And at this halfway point of the season, with a three-week gap until the next race at Zandvoort, there was certainly plenty of food for thought. 